Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar on Like the Music, A Lecture with the Beat, presented by Luther Frank. My name is Mallory McNarsic and I'm the Global Project Manager here at Harman. A few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during this webinar. However, there is a chat function where you can submit questions to the presenter and we'll try to answer as many as possible at the end. This webinar will also be recorded and a link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control. We encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our Learning Sessions Workshop Series on pro.harman.com, as well as visiting Harman Professional University to see our many on-demand and certification courses that are available to you for free. And now I'd like to introduce you to Luther, the presenter for today's webinar. Luther is a lighting designer and sonographer for a variety of industries, including theater, dance, opera, concerts, nightclubs, TVs, and more. Operating out of New York City, he works on an average of 100 unique productions a year with an emphasis on lighting, projection, and scenic design. And I'll pass it over to you, Luther. Thanks, Mallory. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. As, uh, as Mallory said, I'm Luther Frank. I'm a lighting designer primarily, but I also do a lot of work as a sonographer and as a programmer. Um, today, I want to talk about live music. Uh, Martin already has a handful of great webinars on the subject of concerts and touring shows. Uh, those are wonderful. They're filled with tons of advice. I would highly recommend you check out Rob Koenig's session, Collaborations in Lighting, Directors, Programmers, Designers. It's a great look at building a touring career. Uh, there's also Lauren Sagos on programming a festival rig and uh, Eric Price's session on club level touring. These are all great, so please check them out. Today, however, we're going to be looking at an incredibly widespread and varied aspect of the industry. We're going to be talking about live music environments that are more freeform uh, than a touring show. Places like nightclubs, concert venues, corporate shows, social events, any venue where music is played and a lighting rig is deployed to reinforce and carry that energy to an audience. Uh, if you want to go on tour or build a music career around those kinds of shows, uh, then those other webinars I mentioned are a must. Uh, but if you've ever been to an awesome nightclub or seen an amazing live event, a fashion show, a product release, and if I'm being honest here, if you'd like to make a good income in a comparably flexible, low-commitment environment, and you don't want to tour, then this might be the lecture for you. Uh, I'm very thankful to have a network of colleagues who do this work with me. Uh, over the past few years, we've seen early career designers come and go, just pop in and out of this side of the industry, whether they wanted to or not. And after discussing this, we realized that one of the primary reason people leave this industry is that the expectations can be wildly unfair and unclear. Uh, you can be asked to do things with incredible speed and without any prep, and it can be very frustrating. So I wanted to cover that. Uh, unfortunately, in this industry, you're only as good as your last show. And if a client is unhappy with an event, they don't hire you again. The main reason we think people have been let go is that they couldn't find the beat. They couldn't find the story or the arc of a moment uh, or an experience. Their programming might have been technically fine, but the experience just wasn't there. So what I'm going to be speaking about at length today is how to find that beat and that experience and meet those expectations. Uh, I also do want to say as a quick note before we begin that the chaotic pace I'm describing today is way more common than I ever believed. Even now, despite the shutdown, just last night, I received a call to do some live music programming today for a live streamed um, DJ session. I was forwarded a patch and a house spot late in the evening. And as soon as this webinar ends, I'm going to jump on the subway and head over to a studio that I've never been to before. And I have a shoot time of 4 p.m. So as of right now, I am four hours before doors. And I'm not really worried about it. I'm going to show you the skills and strategies I deploy uh, to make that a reality. So specifically, these are the topics I'm going to cover. First, I'm going to cover the various live music environments you could find yourself in. They all have different expectations, different operating procedures, lingo, gear. So I'll try to cover that as best I can. They also tend to have a different idea of how their show will progress. I'm going to try to describe the arc of those experiences. I believe, I believe the ability to stay on target and match those expectations is the key to a successful event and the key to a successful career. So of course, I'll be providing a few examples of each of those venues uh, in my most recent experience. Then we'll go into a quick crash course in music theory. It won't be very detailed, uh, probably just enough to upset a music educator. I can't provide a deep musical analysis class here, but I do want to cover the basics for several reasons. Uh, learning and understanding the fundamental concepts in music will help you when it comes time to find this beat. 
that energy live in the moment. I want to provide some examples of when finding or losing that beat has affected me or other designers in the field. And I want us to go over modern song structure. There is a, um, a semi-universal language that musicians use to describe the parts of their songs. And you have to understand this and learn how those pieces fit together. There's nothing worse than an artist or manager asking you to accomplish a moment based on a part in the music. And you have no idea what they're talking about. So after we go over that, I want to run a quick workshop. WebEx has some problems with audio and video, so I've cut some of the workshop portions out, but I do have one song for us. It's three minutes long. It's just a bit of fun, modern, progressive rock. And I'll give you a, a moment to try to identify the parts of that song and break it down um, so that you could eventually program it. Then I'll provide you an example of my own quick analysis of that same song and an example of a deeper analysis in a situation where you would have had more time and we'll compare those. Uh, if we were running this lecture in person, I would do this with three or four songs across a couple of genres and we could all compare notes, but this will have to suffice for this online environment. Finally, after we've talked about the venues and the scenes and tried to understand the fundamentals of music, I want to provide you with my working methodology, the thing I will be deploying today in just four hours, for accomplishing incredibly fast-paced events. I'll walk you through in detail exactly how I go from nothing to a complete package of tools that I use to accomplish whatever a venue or an artist might throw at me. So this webinar should be understood as a primer to doing a live music event. We're going to have different aesthetics. We're going to have different eyes and opinions. There's an incredible amount of variety out there. Nothing here is set in stone. The biggest takeaway is that you have to be flexible and fast. But hopefully this will serve as a baseline introduction to this kind of work. So let me go into a little bit more detail about what my life has been like since I began working in this side of the industry. I came from a theater background. I went to college and received some degrees in that aspect, but very little of my education uh, or early experience prepared me for this. After college, um, I moved to a major metropolitan area and I was thrown into the deep end head first. I still do a lot of theater, dance, opera, as we mentioned, and all sorts of artistic projects. But these live music events are so common and, and so um, desperate for talent that they really started paying the bills very quickly. After a few years of this wild, fast-paced, hard-to-manage lifestyle, I started keeping notes and journals on what I was up to because, to be honest, it's kind of easy to lose track. So I have another web webinar coming up in two weeks on how to balance that ongoing overbooked workload, so please feel free to join me for that. But because I now journal my work in detail, I can provide an overview of what a year in this industry could look like. Most of my colleagues have similar statistics to these. It should be noted that because I still work in other industries, I purposefully choose not to become tied down to one venue or one act. It's also why I choose not to go on tour with one artist. Uh, you can have a much more stable life if you choose to go that route uh, and just work for one company or one house. But I enjoy the chaos and I need that freedom to keep up all my other endeavors. So in 2019, I worked on around 135 shows. Uh, so you can see a little bit more than half of them were live music events, and most of them uh, were busked or programmed live as well. These were spread across 25 venues. Some I would go to only once, like that bottom right image, uh, which was a pop-up scaffolding stage for a fashion event, and others I would work in 20 times, um, like the bottom left, which is a somewhat stable environment that frequently calls me back. The rigs, the clientele, even the consoles are all different between these venues. So there's a lot of brain switching that's involved in hopping from place to place like this. Uh, you can see a majority of those nights did not include pre-production. What I mean by that is as the designer or programmer, I was not notified of any changes to the house rig, additional gear, guest lists, artist or show information in advance. The majority of these clients and houses simply expect me to show up and in a few hours be ready to accomplish anything. So I'm going to go over those expectations in detail in a bit based on the venue. But this is the first major stumbling block for people. This can feel a bit unfair in the moment, uh, but it's not an impossible task. Some of these nights, and I've included this here, uh, had really high profile artists or individuals, uh, recognizable household names like Ludacris or Alicia Keys or Lizzo, uh, Eddie Vedder. Now, it's much more likely to get some advanced information when you're dealing with uh, someone of that notoriety, but it's not a given. Many times I've had a client or producer come up to me halfway through my afternoon prep and say, oh, by the way, um, Flow Rider is showing up at 10 p.m., so be ready for that, and then walk away, and that's all the prep I get. So finally, I think it's worth noting that this work came from 13 different clients and companies. I have about 20 to 25 total, but those are not live music clients. So 13 live music clients. Some of my colleagues have more, some have less. 
they all hire me under different terms and conditions, and each one has their own operating procedure and, and expectations. They also tend to use language differently. Some will call you a designer and expect you to make minimal decisions, and others will call you a technician or a specialist and then want everything from drafting to crew leading to programming. The whole production start to finish could be in your hands. So I think it's important, at least you, if you want to have a fun and varied career, to be flexible and understanding. Titles and paperwork aren't nearly as important as the show is, and I've tried to credit the production company that's hired me under each session, uh, sorry, under each image in this session, just so that um, the right images associated with the right people. So now that you know a little bit more about me and this kind of work, if you're still interested in living this lifestyle, uh, let's break down the venues that you could run into. So let's start with a big one, uh, something most people watching this have probably gone to and had a good time. You know, as I said in the beginning, I'm not going to talk about being a touring programmer or an early career touring designer. There are already webinars available discussing that. I'm going to talk about venues that do often host tours, but also provide nightly entertainment for locals and local artists. Um, these, are, these are clubs. They're very similar to nightclubs, but they emphasize musicians rather than a sort of party atmosphere. And these houses do hire regular programmer designers to run and manage their venues. Many of my colleagues have permanent positions at these venues. I'm not a permanent uh, fixture in any of these venues, but um, I rotate through, I cover just for them, I, I take a few nights off their hands, or sometimes I will bring a band or an artist in for a one-off performance. That's what's pictured off to the left here. Uh, that's Electric Guest at Rough Trade out in Brooklyn. Um, Duck Lights hired me just to do this one-off for them in New York. There was a house programmer and a manager who helped me get set up and integrated, and he ran the opening act before I took over and ran my show. So here's what you can expect from that kind of a venue. Load-ins happen in the morning. You can frequently be expected to be involved in that physically and mentally. Pre-production, uh, sorry, pre-programming time is, is understood usually in these venues. You don't have to fight for it. You can expect a few hours of dark time and the staff will likely turn off the lights for you. You will have to share this with sound and talent, but you still can count on it usually. You should include opening acts or DJs or after parties uh, in your planning. As a, It's a part of the whole experience and you should support your colleagues. They're gonna support you back. Um, I'm gonna talk about design cycle for all these types of venues. And what I mean by that is the cycle of planning an event in a space, who is in charge and what feels normal for people in that venue, uh, start to finish, sort of standard procedure for getting a show up and out. So for concert venues, there's usually a stable house rig that doesn't change very much. In this photo, you can see the house LED wash units up there behind the band. We brought in a floor package, which is uh, what's creating those white beams from the stage. It's a very common thing to do. So there's often a house designer who you need to interface with and respect. Um, or if that's you, then there might be a traveling LD to take care of. Uh, respect and calm demeanor are key. Definitely find the important people in the venue early on. They might not introduce themselves. Let them know who you are and ask them how you can help them out throughout the night. Um, I think it's important to speak confidently, but also casually. These colleagues of yours have seen and worked on hundreds of shows, so there's no need to panic. There's no need to get stressed out. Uh, if you are the house LD, then there is an expectation that you know the rig inside and out. Power, data, fixture profiles, try to have all that on hand. The reverse is true if you're bringing in gear. Also understand how that gear and how, how you would prefer to integrate it uh, if possible. As a house LB, hopefully you get a little advanced information and can spend some time looking up your visiting talent, especially if they don't have a traveling LD, uh, so that you can digest the music and do a little bit of song analysis if you, if you have time. I, I always try to analyze at least a couple of the major songs as soon as an artist's name is put in my ear. Go on YouTube, go on Vimeo or something and try to find their most popular works because it's likely to show up in your show. Um, you are expected to provide these artists with the kind of energy and style that they desire. They have an image and an atmosphere, uh, and more often than not, um, other people have talked about this in other webinars, by the way, shows are being filmed and photographed by audiences more than ever. And so the more Instagrammable or photo and camera ready you can make their night, the better it's gonna look uh, after the fact and the more likely people are gonna be excited to hire you again. So next up, and in a similar vein, is nightclubs. These venues operate sometimes five days a week with uh, different talent every night or maybe with a roster of house DJs, mixers. Most nightclubs I've found want to work with a small team of designer programmers on regular schedules. Uh, but still, they often require outside personnel and that's been my main experience. I end up at a different club every couple of months 
usually to cover for an LD friend of mine or because a company is coming in to do a specific kind of party and they want me to be there. In that last case, there still might be a house LD and it's always very important to respect their house and just communicate your needs and desires clearly. Working in nightclubs often comes with a lifestyle commitment. Call times are late, as you can see. That club on the left actually called me close to 10 p.m. some nights. Uh, I was splitting duties with a house programmer who was running sort of an opening show, and then the club would open for dancing closer to 10. So somewhat ironically, these venues can be the most stable. They, they have the clearest procedure and timelines. They often have checklists or, or detailed timing of how their night is going to go. The design cycle is fairly simple. Most clubs get designed and then maintain that design for a run of time. Some clubs never change and others change with the seasons. The, the owners of these venues often have very specific ideas of what their venue is. There is an ideal they shoot for and there is an expectation that you as an LD, visiting or house, will maintain that desired aesthetic. Uh, changing it can cause problems for you. Uh, occasionally, party-specific gear will be brought in, but that's less common than in other venues I'm going to talk about today. So the main concern of a nightclub is maintaining that flawless experience night after night. Promoters want a club that's reliably awesome, and owners want a club that fits their, their sort of dream aesthetic. So they want them, their audiences to, keep, uh, to come and to keep coming to enjoy that aesthetic as long as possible. So now this type of show is my favorite. It's, it's for many reasons. Corporate shows cover a wide range of experiences. This can be anything from fashion shows to new product releases, cars. Um, they can be generic brand celebrations or end of year parties. There are a multitude of reasons why a corporation will want to gather people together in an exciting environment. They tend to rely heavily on light to tell their stories and make the evenings memorable. As it's often one night only, you get to make interesting decisions and execute bigger ideas. The working hours and procedures are going to vary a lot. It depends on when they want the experience to happen. Some are in the middle of the day and some are more like a nightclub experience. So day to day, the hours are wildly different. The key with procedure on these events is to understand you are likely to be in the middle of a lot of highly opinionated and frequently justified critics. These can be high stress environments, so I try to keep it simple. Satisfy the client honor any artists that may be present, and respect the venue. The design cycle I said is, is one of my favorites. Most of the time, it can, it, most of the time at least, it, it can be a headache sometimes. But you frequently get to work with the best stuff. Uh, all the gear is in and out in one or two days, so it's often the newest toys available to any given production house. Um, I get to use all of the, the brand new, fun, exciting products um, like from Martin, on corporate events more often than not. Uh, the spaces they choose are usually unique and interesting, and you're trying to create something memorable. However, this does mean that your equipment can and often is negotiated right up until load-in, and frequently not by you. There are a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Um, clients, production houses, and venues can all put their foot down suddenly and make dramatic changes to whatever gear you want to bring in, whether you like it or not. Everyone involved is a professional relationship you need to consider, and so fighting them is probably the wrong choice. Part of this design cycle is identifying the parts of your spec that are most important and making a clear and concise argument for those aspects and being flexible on everything else. Communication is always key, but it's very important in the corporate world um, to communicate clearly, early, and often. But don't ask too many questions and express every single concern you may have. A big part of this is inspiring confidence, right? So not just in the client, but in the venue as well. You need to come across as someone who knows what they're doing, uh, someone who's going to take care of everyone involved. The venue wants to know you're not going to damage their home or make their life difficult, which is a reasonable expectation. And the client, of course, has this whole grand idea to worry about, and they want to know you're capable of achieving your part successfully. Um, in the middle of those two parties is often the hired talent, the music, uh, big or small. It doesn't matter. They deserve your respect and attention as well. Much of the experience is going to be driven by the music and atmosphere that they deploy, so they should be a focus of your work, even if it's not covered in detail with your discussions in other parties. Last, last and often called least is the social event. Uh, these can get tedious once you've done a uh, few uh, enough of them, but they're still very important events, and there are tons of them. Hundreds, if not thousands, of these happen each year in New York alone. 
Um, these include everything from weddings to mitzvahs to graduations to birthdays, anything really. If a person with enough budget to warrant a lighting rig wants to celebrate an occasion, it's usually a big event. Uh, often these clients will rent out high profile venues, national museums or monuments, or just famous hotels with landmark views and high class amenities. These locations usually contain grand ballrooms that can be rented and serviced according to the needs of an event. So that those two photos on the left is a venue I work at quite a bit. And that's two nights back to back in the exact same space shot from the same angle, just to show you the scale and sort of dramatic difference between any two given nights. And also can show you how I, I sort of use light to alter the space dramatically given the needs and desires of any, any specific client. So the working procedure for these venues is usually fairly straightforward, but also often the most specific. Um, most celebrations happen after people get off work, so you can expect a call to go from, you know, early afternoon, noon, one or two, to about one or two in the morning. Uh, I will say these venues are much more likely to enforce a dress code. I would say close to 100% of the shows in this environment have required me to wear a full suit. Uh, many different people can hire you for these events. You could come in with the band. You could, the planner may have hired a production company that sub-hired your company. Or you, maybe you got involved with the venue itself and the house staff and you're local to that venue. Either way, um, once these events have, have started to go up, it's important to know that the family, the, the voice, is, is usually the most important voice in the room. It's not the people who hired you, ironically. Um, companies refer to them as the end client. And if they sort of go around your boss to tell you something, if they, if they want you to make a change, it's probably a good idea to follow their word and then check in with your company after the fact and say, hey, we made this change because the client was unhappy. Um, they are, it is their show, right? Even if you weren't hired by them. So the design cycle for these events can be a little different with so many people involved and it being so personal. Um, it's not always the case. Sometimes I can be hired and there's a very theatrical approach and it has drafting and concept meetings and it's wonderful. But more often than not, the end client doesn't want to deal with all the moving parts. Um, so you end up three or four companies deep from the person with the vision. And so sales teams and company contracts and outside designers will often have a hand in what ends up on site for you to use. Um, this is one of the few environments where it's actually more common for there to be no official lighting designer. Obviously, people are still making those decisions, but the title is the last thing on anyone's mind, and they just expect you to know what you're doing and to do it well. There's an expectation that these experiences are seamless. Um, you are relied on to take visual cues from the decor, the theming, band, and just make it work. The client or the planner might make their opinions known at some point, but you are very much the icing on the cake. Um, there are a lot of elements they wanna focus on before speaking with you, so they often won't wanna check lighting looks until an hour from before doors are less. So it's good to plan for that. Have several ideas waiting just in case they come in with a very different aesthetic eye and hate what you've done. Um, there's also an emphasis on photo and video, like concerts, but even more. Uh, what this means is that the family is going to look back on this event in photo, and if it doesn't look great, they might not hire the various companies involved in the production ever again. So it's important to pay attention to speeches, moments, fam uh, family gatherings, and generally anywhere the photo team is paying attention to, have lighting ready to make those moments beautiful on film, not just in reality. So. It's worth it to go and introduce yourself to those teams as well. Um, let them know they can come to you if they're ever having a hard time taking pictures in any place. Trust me, this is gonna pay off dividends in the long run. This is what's gonna get you more and more work and bigger and bigger shows in this field. Um, the biggest expectation though, and this will work as a good segue into our next slide, is that you have to provide the right energy at the right time. A social event has a very specific emotional arc. And anytime I've seen complaints about a lighting designer or a programmer's work in this environment, it's almost always due to them being off beat. Not just in any given song, but in every moment overall. You can't treat a father-daughter dance like a rave, unless you're absolutely sure they want that. You need to make sure the room is calm and romantic and elegant when important people are speaking. And yes, when it's time to go wild, you need to be ready to go wild. And if you don't nail these moments, the entire evening can feel off and uninspired. So with that in mind, I wanna talk about the arc of an experience and quickly help to uh, describe what I mean by that. 
So what you're looking at here are various generic arcs based off of uh, a generic type of event. They represent my baseline feelings towards how an average show of each type would progress. I've stolen this trick from uh, Mickey Kuntu, who is an incredible lighting designer. Uh, most likely, he was the lead lighting designer for uh, Cirque du Soleil. Uh, he described this te technique in a lecture to me maybe seven years ago. Uh, it's a minimalist way to understand the energy of an event over time. It can be a song, a dance piece, or an entire show. Um, you can create these on scraps of paper very quickly. It's a simple thing you can do even as you listen to a song for the first time. The x-axis represents time, start to finish, of any given event. And the y-axis represents sort of emotional intensity. What this helps you do when you're designing and programming is tell you when you need to be showing off all your best and brightest tricks and when you need to be subtle. It's a natural feature of most music to do this, to have a rising and falling sense, to have a, a, an emotional tension and release. We crave this arc in most of our mediums, film, you know, music, I, most art relies on this, uh, novels rely on this. So when I know what kind of experience I'm building, even if I haven't had time to prep, even if I haven't been sent any materials, I can still have a sense of where I am and where I'm likely to go. Now these three arcs are generic, like I said. Corporate has the, a tendency to have the greatest variance event to event, but they also communicate the most when that's the case. Um, so I'm very used to performing those under very different structures. Um, nightclubs are usually straightforward. They want to achieve an energy and maintain it. Um, I've provided a step pattern here to represent those moments in the night when either the DJs switch or make an announcement. Um, there's a very stereotypical hype moment to signify to the crowd that it's really time to party now, and before that was just the warm-up, and so there's a step up, and you're at a new energy level. These are, these are common, um, but other times there are no change, no announcements, and they simply want to maintain that flat, high-level energy. They usually also don't have a climax. They, they run right up until closing and then just stop. It can be very jarring, and it's not how I like to end a night, but I've seen it happen all the times in clubs, so be ready for that. Um, Corporate can be all over the place, particularly if it's a multi-part event. One of the first big shows I did in New York was a fashion show for Harley Davidson, um, which included an after-runway performance by Ludacris. Um, the runway was an obvious hype moment, right? That required a ton of focus. But then there was a bit of a lull after the runway where uh, photographers and press were allowed to observe the models on a side stage and, of course, drink and discuss and socialize. And then later, Ludacris came out with even bigger energy, and he ran a very standard concert set uh, that would conclude the party. So, so that arc would have had two high points. Um, the social arc tends to be very predictable, but is also the most subtle and requires the greatest deal of finesse one moment to the next. Um, moments rarely jump from one energy to another, at least not on blackouts and sharp musical hits like you would find in other environments. Instead, they tend to flow. They tend to sway seamlessly between each other. Um, or at least that's how they want to feel. It's a much more people-oriented experience, and your lighting needs to be timed to the beat to make it help feel that way. So a big part of figuring that out, when to go and how to go, has everything to do with timing, right? And the most basic form of timing we can talk about, uh, the foundational concept in music, is the beat. So there's a lot to talk about here, and I assume most of you will have some form of music education or experience already, so this stuff will be mostly a refresher. But if that's not the case, I highly suggest you take some time to explore these concepts outside of work. Um, join a jam band or, or at least go to a drum circle. Uh, find a simple way to explore rhythm. Um, before I continue, unfortunately, WebEx has some limitations, and I was going to play these time signatures for you. I'll, I'll attempt to clap a few of them out. Um, but these are all taken from Wikipedia which I firmly believe to be an amazing resource on most things, uh, but especially for foundational concepts in things like math and music. Um, the Wikipedia page on meter and on beat, they are separate, by the way, are excellently written, with tons of examples and descriptions, so you can follow along there at the same time as you wish. It could send you down a rabbit hole, though. I mean, it, it's so well uh, conceived, and I want to keep this quick and easy. So I want to start with meter. Any sense of rhythm, uh, the timing of a piece of music, this is expressed through the concept of meter. It's a complex topic, but most basically defined, it's a regular recurring pattern in beats. So there's a very interesting phenomenon I want to try with you, uh, but you need to listen closely. So if you don't have full attention, I, full attention for just a moment, pay attention to the sounds I'm about to make. Tick, talk, 
tick. So did you feel that? Your brain probably said talk for you. Even if I didn't say, say, say talk, and even if it didn't say talk, you probably felt it. Our brains are wired to seek out these patterns. And when they don't complete, it comes as a jolt. I only said talk once. I didn't have to say it twice for you to feel like I should have. And there's no logical reason for you to think that I would outside of expectations and the pattern your mind has envisioned when pacing those first tick tock. There's a great quote here about this phenomenon that I want to read for you. It's just, once a metric hierarchy has been established, we as listeners will maintain that organization as long as minimal evidence is present. I can think of no more minimal evidence than three words or three beats that immediately call to mind a fourth. This is the importance of the beat and the crucial nature of understanding meter so that the beat can be logged and expected by fellow musicians and yourself. Time signature is how we write down the understanding of meter on paper so as to easily define those beats. So below that quote are probably the two most common time signatures in Western music. I want to say 90% of what you hear on the radio fall into these two time signatures. 4-4 four, four is expressed very simply. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. And 3-4 three, is expressed like 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3. You may recognize that naturally feels like a waltz, but there are many genres and songs that slip into 3-4 all the time. You may wonder why this matters or how helpful this is when you're working live with little prep, but I want to point you all in the direction of a really amazing video on YouTube. I hope you'll check this out when we're done here. Uh, I'm going to try to remind us about this at the end of the lecture as well. Just search Umphrey McGee, Jefferson Wafel, LD Commentary, or Jefferson Wafel, LD Commentary. Any of those words will probably get it. There's not that much content uh, on our industry on YouTube. Um, it's really phenomenal. Umphrey McGee, McGee is a uh, progressive rock band, and Jefferson Wafel has been their designer for some time. But because it's prog rock, he has to run a majority of their show live, even though he's a touring designer. Um, in the moment, the music can vary. What the band chooses to play can change from night to night, or even mid-song, they can choose to go into a different part. In this video, between minute two and five, he tells and shows this amazing moment in the music where mid-verse, the time signature changes from 4-4 four, four to 3-4. It's a very, it's very almost unnoticeable change. And he was missing his lighting cue almost every night until the bass player of the band actually took him aside and gave him the counts and showed it to him, and it allowed him to hit his mark. Jefferson Wafel is a way better designer than I am. I mean, he's, he's, he's got an amazing uh, history behind him, and even he was struggling to find this sort of beat change. So this is one example of how your understanding of time is going to affect your ability to give the artist the show they desire. So I sincerely hope you all check that out. Again, I'll try to remind us at the, at the end of the lecture. Um, fundamentally, a beat is just a basic unit of time. It can be referred to uh, through all sorts of different concepts, um, like pulse, tempo, rhythm, meter, rhythm groove. It's a means of communicating something our body tries naturally um, uh, to understand and keep pace with. Now, rhythm is one step further. It refers to the sequence of stressed and unstressed beats, or on and off beats, divided up into bars of musical in time signature. Um, this is so critical. So I want to cover a few of the concepts that are likely to come up when speaking to musicians. The first is the downbeat. Right? This actually refers to a classic music tradition of a conductor literally striking a downbeat with their baton. Um, the conductor begins the piece with a downward motion of the baton, and we play. Um, this also refers to the first beat in any given bar, and it's known colloquially as uh, on the one. Like rock musicians, jazz musicians, hip hop, they'll say on the one, you know? And you could be told to take something on the one, either by an artist or a producer or a stage manager. Um, so, sorry about this. Yeah, you could be told to take something on the one. So make sure it happens uh, uh, on the one. They may even tell you to take something on the one in a different measure, or they'll say wait for four measures and you need to know how to count those measures in four, four or three, four. So you take it on the right one. Um, now this is where it gets tricky. Because especially in jazz and funk and R&B, but honestly all over music, uh, we, we start timing our rhythm to an on or an off beat or a back beat. Reggae will actually often completely forgo the downbeat and with something called a one drop. They just, they just take the one right out of the music. And so everything is on a two, three, and four. Uh, again, I can't play these clips for you, the back beat and the one drop. And, uh, uh, but I highly suggest you go to this Wikipedia and just listen through. You'll immediately recognize 
uh, a ton of songs that you know and love across all genres of music. Um, this matters because you're gonna be designing and firing your looks on these beats. I don't wanna throw anyone under the bus, so I won't tell any names, but uh, a little more than 10 years ago when I was just doing basic uh, labor in an arena, uh, a show was being programmed. It was a major artist, uh, very famous at the time, and they were building his show that was about to go out on tour. He was a rock artist, and he was very involved with what the lighting looked like. Some artists don't care as much, but he was out there looking at the rig as he was playing. And the, the, the programmer was presumably early in, in, in their career as well. They were a new hire, um, and they were having trouble, obvious trouble. He, he was just a little off, a little off on every big transition. And he was, he was counting ones when he should have been counting twos or twos when he should have been counting ones. And eventually, this is mid-rehearsal, the, the artist gets so upset, he cuts the music and he screams into the microphone for the whole arena to hear, hey, lighting guy, it goes on the beat and claps out the beat for him. And this is very embarrassing, obviously, and you don't want to be caught in that position. So a strong understanding of simple beat and meter concepts will pay off in the long run. I'm sure of it. Don't neglect this. Sorry, so now I'm hearing the songs play through uh, PowerPoint. Let me just jump through them. One second, and there we go. So now to something a little more descriptive, a little less theoretical. There is a, a set of parts that almost all modern music is created with. The, there are exceptions, but these are still a, an effective way of understanding almost everything out there. When musicians build their songs, Again, in almost any genre, they use this terminology to describe the individual components of the piece. These should be memorized by anyone who wants to do live music. I say that because I can't tell you how many times a manager or producer has come to me in the middle of a show and given me a note, literally as we were live and rolling, and said, hey, good job, but in the next song, right as that second chorus hits, I need you to go to a full gold look. It's for PR. Thanks. And then they duck out of the booth. You have to know when that's coming. You just have to. So it's critical that when speaking to an artist, you use this terminology correctly. They want to know you understand their music structurally and you're going to take care of them. So with that in mind, I want to go through them quickly and then we'll do the workshop. We'll describe these and then I'm going to play you a song and you can try your best to analyze it in one pass, which is fairly difficult. Um, so an intro is very straightforward. It's the beginning. It sets up the melodic themes, the style. It's usually lets you know what's coming, but it can also set up a surprise. The verse is one of the two most important parts of a song. You spend most of your time in a verse or the chorus, uh, and a majority of your lighting will rest in these moments. Verses frequently repeat music, but almost always have different lyrics. Uh, a build is what takes you from the verse to the chorus. It's usually very short, but very powerful. Uh, the chorus is probably the most recognizable part of any song. It's what everyone wants to sing. It contains the hook, the main message of a song, and it's probably where you want to deploy your most well thought out lighting looks. Uh, this is the Sweet Home Alabama of Sweet Home Alabama. Uh, this part can be referred to as the refrain, so don't let that throw you. Now, the post chorus is kind of a modifier term. I spoke with musicians who have post choruses but don't use the phrase and vice versa. Um, they, they might just say the second part of the, the chorus or something similar, but it's a modification of an already established chorus, and this is super common. Uh, especially in like the last chorus of pop songs. There's, there's almost always a post-chorus. A bridge can be found anywhere, but it's often found between verses or between, before things like solos. Uh, it's a unique piece of music, different from the verse or chorus, usually fairly short and noticeable. Um, I've heard these called transitions, breakdowns, and there's a musical tradition called the middle eight, which happens in reference to AABA 32 bar form. This is, you know, classical music uh, we're talking about, and it happens in the middle eight bars of a 32 bar structure. Um, so you might hear that in more um, snobby circles, but transition and breakdown, honestly, breakdown is the most common in rock and roll. Uh, a solo is exactly what it sounds like. It's when your lead artist or, or a particular member of a band will take center stage and just riff for a while. It's a climactic moment. It's usually big and bombastic. It's very hard to miss the solo. And then you have the outro, which usually like the intro is fairly obvious, although sometimes it's completely absent nowadays. It can also be called a tag or a coda, but again, I, I usually only hear those in sort of classical or maybe jazz, uh, jazz venues. So on the left there is a very simple structural analysis of the song. Hopefully it's close to what you have. Um, if you didn't separate the verse into two parts, like I mentioned, you'd have uh, far less timestamps and some fairly lengthy sections, but that's okay. 
Uh, honestly, a lot of the details in verse one can be accented live with uh, live effects anyway. So on the right, you can see a much more detailed analysis uh, of the song after three or four passes. This contains some shorthand lingo to let me know exactly what's coming in each part. And depending on time, I could use this as a quick reference to build a much more complicated show should the artist and I want to go in that direction. But this is where it all starts. Um, if we were in person, now would have been a good time to pass around notes and talk about structure and do this a few more times with other genres. Uh, if you ever have the chance to do this in person with other designers, I would. That may sound crazy, but I was able to do that with Brad Schiller, who was one of the moderators here a few years back uh, when he ran a song analysis class. Uh, I believe the focus was on EDM, and that's much tougher than something like this. Um, unfortunately, we're not in person, so we're going to move on. Um, but I hope that's a little helpful for you. I'm frequently in situations where artists are arriving and I have less than an hour to go through their history, their discography. Um, this happened to me with like Lizzo uh, a little bit before she became a household name, right after she won the Grammy, I believe. Uh, and I had no idea who she was. And I, <laughs> I went on, found the most important songs she had, tried to detail them out, tried to build looks and be ready for those. The manager showed up, I showed them, we tweaked them, and within a couple hours we had a show. So, you know, we've covered the details and the expectations of various live music events that you can find yourself at, and we've talked about the basic building blocks of music. So now I'm going to put all that together into a working methodology. Uh, this will be my process of going from walking into the doors of a venue to putting on a great show that same night. So where do I start? Uh, obviously, I prefer to get started the night before, <laughs> if I can. Uh, um, but it starts with the venue. Uh, research and prep time is wonderful, and you should take every second if you can. But if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Um, so as soon as I get a call, I will start the process then, um, and I start by looking at the venue. I try to understand the nature of the structure, why this particular client wants to have a live event happen there, um, who are my contacts there, and if there are people I need to meet, I want to meet them sooner rather than later. Um, I think it's important to try to figure out your function in the machine of the evening. Um, it actually does vary quite a bit. Some situations call for you to step in and lead and take on many different roles to achieve a production value your client is looking for. And other times it's best to stay collected and in the back, ready to produce good work when other parties are ready to see it. This understanding begins with the building, the organizations and outside research, but it's quickly overtaken by important conversations with people on site. Um, as soon as you meet your colleagues, your directors, you should try to start having conversations about their vision. Try your best not to get bogged down into specifics yet. You just got here. You don't understand everything. So you really shouldn't be talking about what color that column should be if you can avoid it. Start by developing a terminology, right? What is this event supposed to feel like? Is it elegant or is it dark and brooding? I mean, should, how, how are we as an audience supposed to feel? Is it, should we feel powerful or sexy or high energy or cool? What are the defining features of the evening? This is going to help you understand the arc. Hopefully the timeline is finalized at this point, but you'd be surprised. Sometimes it isn't. Um, but once you receive this information, you should think about and internalize your understanding of the arc. And this may be a good time to pull out a piece of paper and set some quick goals. Focus by 1 p.m., color with client at 2, uh, simple song looks for sound check by 3, 3 p.m. Uh, things like that to help keep you on, on task. Um, sticky notes are great. You know, stick them right on your console if you need to. Um, make sure you write down big notes from the client or the director. You know, know what's important to them. That'll help you make sure you get it in time for them to feel comfortable. This is all before you've touched a console. Um, this whole getting to know you process should take less than 30 minutes on site, um, but it can take longer with talkative clients and staff. So now once you've had time to get the facts straight in your head, again, I love to do that in advance, but uh, sometimes it happens on arrival. Once it's done, it's time to begin the real work. Whether you have a programmer or not shouldn't change much of this. This is all concept-based. Uh, true, if you have a programmer that you trust, you may leave them to their own devices for a while, but it would still be a good idea to check in and make sure they are prioritizing the same things you are. So I start with the basics for many reasons, but the big one is as soon as the client sees a good-looking home cue, the sooner they relax. Even if you're going to change it later, getting the gear functional and on and in something close to where you think it will live will make the rest of the setup go so much smoother. Um, front light for talent seems obvious, but it should be an early priority. Basic stage look, basic house look, front light. Find and record a home or two, uh, but at least one good look. Now that the rig is on, I like to start asking questions, looking for issues before they arise. 
if I'm coming in with a large lighting package, venues will sometimes neglect to focus the house lighting package. Um, they'll, they'll say things like, you've got all these movers, you don't need the, the, the house leakers, right? You're just gonna use movers. I don't feel that way. It's, it's not a redundant feature to me. What if I lose a whole run of power or my DMX goes down? Um, sure, I'm gonna have another part of my rig ready to do double duty. That's part of due diligence. But I also want those house fixtures ready to go. Um, I've needed them many times in the past. So ask your what if questions. Gear fails, power goes out, wireless signal drops. If any part of your evening is one point of failure away from ruining the event, look for solutions now. Uh, see if you can deploy a crew leader to suss out a solution if they have the time while you move on to, to more programming and design work. So then you do move on to your simple go-to ideas. I have reusable in parentheses here because these ideas are so basic. Uh, they can generally travel from show to show in an easy to copy state. Uh, the concept of a spotlight doesn't change with gear. Uh, so cues and effects that call on that spot, spotlight can be reliably copied. Um, excuse me, new gear gets a new best spotlight preset and gets integrated. Um, universal or generic data is awesome at this. And I believe you should have 10 to 20 ideas traveling with you at all times, just in my bag ready to go. Um, I've included the spotlight as the most basic, uh, but I've also included fire and ice as other ideas I like to travel with. If I ever wanna set a room on fire you know, in light, not real, or dramatically cool it down with lighting, I want those simple ideas ready to deploy. I want a basic texture and color for the fixtures I'm using to quickly do those. Um, these are just simple ideas that you can go to at any time. They will help you get out of uh, stuck spots and make sure you always have something you can throw into the mix. All of this should take you around 30 minutes to complete. Often shorter, but this is where problems can arise that need fixing, so 30 minutes. Moving on from there, the next step is to make sure my simple effects get up and running across the rig. Make sure the parameters are set so the effects make sense on a home timing in the environment you're in, which is usually a 4-4 time and 60 BPM that you should be ready to alter. Um, just like before, these are simple and they travel with you. I copy from these effects to make detailed or site-specific cues later, so getting them up and running should take less than one minute. Perfect, much less if you're fast and, and comfortable with the console. Palettes are similar, uh, bringing in your favorite colors that you should have saved and stepping through them with the rig that you have up today, uh, making quick adjustments as needed. You should have simple forms, beam sizes, frost settings, irises, all those features have basic points of reference that you want quick access to. And of course, the basic positions. Uh, I've included must-haves here, uh, you know, stage, house, 45 up and out. But there are gonna be a few positions you'll always want to reference in your cues and effects. This will take you longer depending on the size of your rig, so don't go crazy here. Don't get stuck building out a focus grid, you know, a 50 point grid in a venue and losing all your time. Um, once a venue becomes a repeat customer, then a grid is a nice tool to develop. Um, this picture on the left is a good example of those basic positions in a home preset. You've got stage, house, 45 up and out. I work in this venue a lot and I have a grid there, um, but I start by checking the basic forms first, and so do most of my colleague LDs. Um, for instance, Wes Richter, who is in chat today, uh, who I actually worked on this event together with. Um, so from there, I work on my modifiers. These are either faders, macros, or commands that allow you to alter the size and shape of everything you've just made. These need to be accessible and easy to reach in less than a second. They are the tools by which you will control everything live. They are the tools by which you will alter the beat of your work. Make sure you have some quick time changes. Going back to the song we just listened to, I'm sure you could have imagined how useful it would be to double or half time your running effects. There were several breakdowns and, and uh, verses in there with drum hits that would just suddenly speed up the work. And if you had dimmer effects going, you could quickly double in and half out of those moments and, and just keep that beat and energy in your life. Um, these fundamental components should also take you between 30 minutes to an hour. Um, but here's where you can develop real speed over time and get that number down. By now, about an hour and a half has progressed on site. So with all of the generic stuff and basic tools created, I like to work on site-specific things next. This is also a great time to get out from behind the desk and walk around the venue. The client may have provided some extra gear through different venues. Um, some bands and artists will travel with equipment that you may not have been aware of. So now's the time to you know, run the Malina DMX and integrate their pyro you know, so that you can run it. Um, other companies might be bringing in floral arrangements or branding or disco balls, all stuff that needs light to function. 
And much of that is going to be lit with your static inventory, and hopefully your cru crews are getting close to focus on that, but now is the time to check it. Uh, you're, you're building your environment. It's also a great time to look at the intricacies of the architecture. This is especially critical if you're in a venue that doesn't allow haze. Um, so to the left, I've provided you a picture of the American Museum of Natural History here in New York. Uh, it's a venue where no haze is allowed, at least most of the time. Um, but I had this big, giant, gray planet structure to play with. So after my generic work was done, I spent time making different planets with light. And I made about eight of them. They're all very different. They all are animated. And these were great tools to use throughout the night, both during the quieter corporate moments and the more exciting after-party ones. Um, it doesn't have to be this obvious, though. Uh, I've been surprised by wooden beams or reflective paint on steel surfaces. Or mirrors and chandeliers are great points to, to focus your lighting. Um, so it might be worth it to play around, see what your lights look like as they bounce around the space. And maybe you can create some very functional ideas from that. This should take you about 30 minutes on average, give or take. Um, so with that in mind, about two hours have passed since you've arrived. So finally, having taking a break to enjoy the space and making sure everything is going well, um, I use everything I've created to finalize the show. This means making sure I have all the big, beautiful moments the client and artists are expecting. It, if it's a high energy event, you're likely to need full rig strobes or wide texture rolls or various beam looks. Um, but also don't forget about what I like to call the show stoppers. Literally, there are many times a show may intentionally stop on a dime. DJs love to cut music. Artists like to break into a speech with the crowd. Um, it's even built into a lot of songs, particularly in EDM. So make sure you have those moments predefined. Tools that will quickly pause or freeze or go to a solo spotlight or otherwise quickly and dramatically change the environment. There's nothing worse than when the DJ yells, cut the music, and the lights are going wild for 20 minutes, uh, 20 seconds. Like, it's, it just it feels wrong. So you've got to be fast. You've got to hit that beat. Uh, and, of course, the finales. Uh, these are going to be very different depending on what kind of event you're in. Like I said, nightclubs often just end, and social events may want something more heartfelt or emotional. Uh, and rock artists may want to go out with a big bang. So know your art and pull out all the stops. You know, use the architecture, use everything, and know how it ends. Once you know how it ends, you're ready for opening doors. So if everything went smoothly, you get to use the rest of your time on this, uh, which could be anywhere from 30 minutes to three hours. The faster you are at all the earlier work, the more time you get to spend building the big impressive moments. In total, less than four hours have passed since you've had a functional rig and the doors have opened. Sometimes you don't have that much time, uh, and other times you have a little bit more. Uh, the more flexible you can be and the better you understand your tools and how to deploy them on the beat properly across an arc, the better position you'll be in to meet and ex exceed those expectations, and the more likely they are to hire you again. So all right, everyone, that was my deep dive into the chaos of live music lighting design. Um, as I said at the beginning of the lecture, as soon as we're done here, I'm headed to a studio that I've never been to, and I'll be lighting a live streaming DJ session tonight for Oxygen Eventworks. Uh, I'll have just a couple hours with the rig before we go live, so it should be a lot of fun. <laughs> so you can go online and check that out if you like, but uh, before I go, I want to take some questions and, and give some answers, so please feel free to ask me anything. Uh, we covered the industries and my methods, of course, but if you're curious about related subjects or personal questions about my career, I'm open to all of those as well. So please let me uh, know what's on your minds. Great. Um, thank you, Luther. We did have some questions come in, and the first one actually is a two-part question. So the first part is, how do you know what music they are, are doing if they're coming to you three hours prior, I'm assuming prior to the show? And well, the right. second, I mean, oh, go ahead with the second part. Sorry, the second part was, then how do you put the music show together? Right, so a big part of this chaotic world is making sure, and the methodology is making sure that you have all your tools ready, right? And so anytime you can do any research, you should. So I'm about to jump on the subway, right? And I've never worked in this space before, but they have work available online. So I'll pick up my phone and I will listen on the subway and digest as much as I can. And that's why my first step is never programming when I get to a venue. My first step is conversation. It's finding a client, finding a, a director, finding an artist, and, and trying to get some of that information as soon as possible. And I limit it to 30 minutes because we've got to get the work done, right? But so you have to seek the information out. And, you know, of those 70 nights, yeah, maybe five or 10 times, um, 
it, it just didn't happen. And I truly had to be live. And it's like, oh, I guess we're doing country tonight. And then my brain goes into a different mindset, pulls up a different set of tools, and is ready for the timing and beat of that experience. Um, that has happened. I've had big brass jazz bands that are playing classical, like Roaring Twenties style jazz. And then we just snapped into like an EDM DJ at midnight. And that, yeah, that's a, that's a brain twister. So, you know, that's the chaos of the industry. So the longer you're in it, the more tools you can develop, but you got to be flexible and you got to be fast. Great. So the next question is when working in a club, how do you deal with a DJ that keeps changing the BPM throughout the night? Yeah, I mean, that's why on the fundamentals page, there's, there's your tools for changing the beat, right? Um, if you're lucky, you're close enough to talk to them and you can develop a, a physical language. I have been lucky enough. We get a good DJ rolling and then we'll, like, we'll give each other the signal that we want to go. That doesn't always happen. A lot of DJs don't care about the lighting and they're there just to mess with beats. So... Yeah, you need to, uh, I think it's helpful to have macros or cues that will change your, your beat structure across many different effects. You know, I've seen people who will have macros that will literally change the BPM and other people who will fade up and down just by ear. So uh, you have to practice. I, I do think that it's important to, to maybe listen to some EDM, listen to some rock and, and tap your finger and try to fire your effects if you don't have a console. You know, it, that's why I say it's very important for you to experiment with rhythm. Right. If you've never played an instrument before, I highly encourage you to, because a lot of this becomes intuitive. Great. So we have some more coming in. So how do you branch or how would you suggest branching out into a different part of the lighting industry when you've only worked in one part so far, such as going from live music to social, corporate to theater, et cetera? Yeah. So that was me. Right. So that's great. I before I had moved to the city. All of my work was sort of in the arts. I did some arena work as just a, a laborer, but I had no live music experience, no busking experience. So the biggest advice I ever received and that I would always tell people is that this is a people business. And um, if you are out of sight, you're out of mind. And so if you, if you desperately want to work in a field in this industry, you should go there. You know, you should do your research, find out who are the production companies doing the work, who are the designers doing the work, and reach out to them. My email will be at the end of this presentation, and if somebody were to email me, I would pass them along to several companies. And this is true of any field in our industry. So if, you, if you're really hungry for the work, uh, it is out there. I mean, I know we're shut down right now, but I'm still working somehow, not nearly as much. But the point is, is that it, it's there for those who seek it. So you have to start seeking. Great. So this kind of goes off of that question. How important is it where you live to develop your network? I mean, I know that all cities across the globe are different, right? And and that's why I said nothing here is set in stone. This is New York is an extremely busy environment. I get that. But I have talked to people who live in L.A. and they describe a similar lifestyle. Um, I've talked to my European friends and they tend to describe a little bit more laid back lifestyle. But I'm sure there are others out there who are living just as many, you know, uh, uh, shows on their on their plate. Um, I don't want to be too rude, but I I do believe you should you should live where you want to live, like uh, and and accept that environments are going to be different. I I think my hometown was the wrong place for me, right? In my hometown, there was a couple venues, and it was all very very low budget, and a lot of people love that. I mean, I've talked to people in that hometown area, and this is the Tampa Bay area in Florida who uh, like um, got their degrees and went off and toured and everything and then came back home and started a club. And they and a promoter, you know, they worked on the rig together and it's a labor of love and it's beautiful and they have fun every week. And if that's what you want, that's great. But if you want to, like, if you want a tour, you might want to go live where those production companies uh, operate out of, like New York or Nashville or Las Vegas, like, so that you can become friends with PRG and all the people who work in that field. I do think that is important. Great. So what is your favorite music genre to light? To light? Um, God, you know, um, when I'm when I'm lighting, I let go a lot of uh, of my personal music flavors just so that I can uh, appreciate the moment more. Um, but I've had, you know, I guess honestly, it's EDM because EDM surprises me more than any other genre. Right. EDM trips me up more than any other any other genre. And so when you nail it, 
you get a, a bigger payoff, right? Um, it's not like the payoff in rock or rap or R&B isn't there. It's great. It's a lot of fun. But the payoff of really, really wild and twisted EDM beats um, are just really exciting and different. So I, it's probably EDM. Great. Or other te techno, dance, rave, whatever you want to call it. Great. Um, the next question is, is there any software to help you quickly timestamp when listening to a song? You know, um, I don't know that. I know that a lot of people who work in time-coded environments would probably have a better answer for you. I know that a lot of people are trying to use Reaper these days. I don't know if that's helpful. That could, that's kind of a shot in the dark for me. I'm old school. I'm pen and paper. Like, I like to do my arcs on paper, and I like to write down notes on songs. I don't usually transcribe them um, to PC. Uh, or to PC, to any digital medium, really, um, because I'm doing them live most of the time, right? So if I were analyzing a show, or the few times I have built long time-coded events, I'm still doing it just in sort of a Word doc or an Excel sheet. Um, so I'm afraid I don't know. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Next question is, um, where do you find the music that might be played? Will the artist producer provide it, or do you have to seek it out? Unfortunately, you usually do have to seek it out. Like when people say Flo Rida is showing up, Ludacris will be here, that's all you get. Um, ask for a set list, and sometimes I'll get a set list, and then you know what will happen is the artist will show up and say, no, I'm not performing those songs. Like, so, so even if you get a set list, you still should probably commit at least five minutes to 30 minutes of your own research. And my go-to is very simple. Social media runs the world nowadays, whether we like it or not. So. I go to the artist's social media, I see what their newest album is, and I see what is top of the charts on that new album. They're going to want to play that song. Then I go to YouTube or Vimeo, and I say, what is the music video with the most views? You can sort by views. Be like, so I don't know who Lizzo is, right? But this song, everyone loves. So even if it's not on the newest album, it's probably coming up. And, you know, you only have time to do this for three or four songs, but that's the crux of the matter. So those are the songs that you can do and, and spend some energy on, and then you have the rest of your toolkit to fill in the gaps. Great. Um, so we have a couple more questions. The next one is, what would you say is the biggest mistake in live music made by young programmers with theater backgrounds? Oh, so yeah, it's, it's what I was talking about in the introduction of this, of this seminar. It is a failure to understand the arc and to meet that expectation because it's very different. I mean, our understanding of, of workflow and procedure and how an event goes in theater is highly structured and it's, it's almost codified into a book. And everybody knows what their job is based on title. And, and when, when our own expectations aren't met, our instinct is to get angry, right? Like, why wasn't I taken care of? Or why wasn't this done the way I was told it should be done? Um, once I got out of, of that environment and I realized just how many thousands of different events are being done across a year and how many people are doing it from so many backgrounds, it allows you to calm down and say, okay, this is not how I would do it, but this is how it's being done. So I have to fit into this machine. If we want to have a successful show tonight, I have to be okay with being called an electrician specialist. Great. I, I don't care. <laughs> you know, and so that is the biggest stumbling block, I think, for early career people is that their own expectations from a job is not going to be met. Nine times out of ten is not going to be what you expect it's going to be. Great. So we had a couple more come in. Um, do you create cues that you can easily adjust throughout a concert? Are your cues only specific for one part of the show? So there are certain cues that are specific to songs, right? And that's why it's good to identify the parts. So it's like, I know that this is going to go in the chorus of this song, which is great. But those early cues, home cues, are super important. You always need to be able to go back to home. Um, and I do think that if you have time, building a safety net of cues is a smart idea as well. So it's like, you know this room looks good in blue. Let's try it in, in a different color, try it in a different texture. Even if that's not what the client says, okay, this is opening, save it so that you can always go back there if you need to cut out or if something happens or if, if I mean, you know, in the, in the electric guest photos that I was showing, halfway through our show, our, um, the audio console crashed in white. They lost everything. And so the artist was suddenly stuck on stage vamping, telling jokes. So, <laughs> so I had to go back to home. I had to provide the spotlight. And, I want, and suddenly, 
it wasn't a high energy concert, so it wasn't a high energy home. I calmed it down. I was like, okay, it's story time with the artist while the audio guy finds a backup file, you know, in his backpack. And it took 20 minutes. So, so yes, have a home cue and then have a few more. Have some safety nets, have some ideas of where to go. That's part of the what if questions. What do I do when it goes wrong? Because eventually you do this many shows, something is going to go wrong. That's great. Um, so we have one more question. Do you have a favorite get out of jail free look that you revert to when you cannot figure out where to go with a certain song? Yeah, yeah, I do. So, uh, and I mean, if I'm being brutally honest, I mean, some nights you're just tired too. <laughs> and if you've done 45 nights straight, which was my sort of like longest run of like 12 hour nights, uh, yes, it becomes sort of muscle memory. It's like, okay, I'm tired. Let's just go to the next idea. Yeah. And so, those are often a mixture of site-specific cues working in the background and those simple ideas in the front, like fire and ice. It's very easy for me to pop into my fire cue when the DJ plays fireball. And, and I, that does kind of sound like phoning it in, and sometimes it can feel that way. But as long as you're hitting the beat, as long as you're maintaining the atmosphere, you're going to meet the expectation. It's when you call the ice cue when they play fireball that everybody's going to go, what the hell's going on? So, <laughs> so um so yes, those simple ideas are great for that. And that's why they're they're one of the first things I do. Great. Well, that looks like all the questions we had come through. If anyone does have any additional questions, you can reach out to Luther directly. I do want to thank everyone for joining. And thank you, Luther, for your time. This was a great session. I appreciate that. And I do want to remind people to check out that Umphrey McGee, Jeff, um, Jason Waffle video. I mean, it's it's just so good. You'll get to see somebody busk a really complicated show. So check that out. Perfect. I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Luther. Great job. Really enjoyed it. Thanks so much, man. It's good to hear from you again, even just a little bit. Yeah. Well, you have fun with your gig tonight. Yeah. I'm off to show. <laughs> yeah. All right. Take care. Bye, guys. Yeah.